we're very pleased to see you here. A quick reminder to please put your phones on silent mode. I can see everybody's just looking at me when I say that. At least pretend to rustle around like you are putting your phones on silent because if it rings during the session, we will come over and we will ask you to leave because it is becoming a real problem. Thank you very, very much for your cooperation with this. So, there will be a Q&A in this session, um, 45 minutes in, so there will be 15 minutes, so please save your questions until the end. And therefore, without saying any more, can I please bring a warm welcome to our speakers for this session in Dika, Prane Lau, in conversation with Pradeep Krishen and introduced by Richard Forte. Um, good afternoon. Um, I, when I was a very young man, I met E.M. Forster, uh, and he was then a very old man. And something that E.M. Forster wrote in his famous novel, A Passage to India, uh, struck me as an entirely appropriate way to uh, introduce Pranay Lal's wonderful and beautiful new book, Indica. So he wrote, Geology, looking further than religion, knows of a time when neither the river nor the Himalayas that nourished it existed, and an ocean flowed over the holy places of Hindustan. The mountains rose, their debris silted up the ocean, the gods took their seats on them and contrived the river, and the India we call immemorial came into being. But India is really far older in the days of the prehistoric ocean, the southern part of the peninsula already existed, and the high places of Dravidia have been land since land began, and have seen, on the one side, the sinking of a continent that joined them to Africa, and on the other, the upheaval of the Himalayas from a sea. They are older than anything in the world. No water has ever covered them, and the sun who has watched them for countless eons may still discern in their outlines forms that were his before our globe was torn from his bosom. Well, that's a kind of very neat geological history. It's almost entirely wrong. Uh, at one time, it was believed that between the Indian continent, as it is, and Africa today, there was land, and that that land foundered to make the ocean we see today. Ideas in geology change. And Pranay Lal is giving us really a state-of-the-art account of the evolution of the Indian subcontinent as we know it today. He summarized a wealth of scientific information. And um, Pradeep Krishen, another na distinguished naturalist, uh, will engage to discuss some of the ideas thrown up in this wonderful book. And I will, I will just start off uh, by inviting Pranay to tell us something about how he got involved with this project. What led him to it? Pranay. Uh, thank you, Professor Forti. Um, I grew up in uh, North Africa. And, uh, oh, not working? Closer, okay. Uh, I grew up in North Africa, and um, as a child, I Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I grew up in North Africa and uh, spent my childhood uh, with Bedouin kids. And uh, one of the things that I did was uh, explore the wildlife. And uh, you know, we hunted for, or searched for scorpions and snakes, and you know, all the critters that you find in the desert. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a fondness for nature has stayed with me and something that most children tend to lose when they grow up. Uh, and I have retained this curiosity for nature and the love for nature since. Um, when I did my first master's in biochemistry, uh, I studied you know, the cellular structures and how the DNA works and how species are created. I took a second master's in uh, forestry, which is like taking the scale away from a microbe 
to an ecosystem. And that gave me a perspective about uh, you know, the larger things in life. Um, one of the people, I, I studied at Oxford University, and one of the people I met there, I mean, among the many, many brilliant minds, was one person who was somebody who used to take us to field trips, and his name was Frank Thompson. Uh, he was no heavyweight intellectual or, or a published academic. He was just a person who used to take you for field uh, visits. And he inspired me so much because he did something very peculiar. When he used to take us to forests, he would pick up a piece of soil and put it in his mouth, and he would taste it. And uh, after th uh, 10 seconds or 20 seconds, he would spit it out. And he would say, he would just, you know, think about it, you know, what he was tasting, and he would be able to tell you the kind of minerals or kind of salts or compounds that that soil had. And he would be able to tell you so much about the forest that was so amazing. And that's something that stayed with me for a very long time. And many years later, when I came back to India, um, I was working as a journalist in, uh, you know, doing odd stories about science reporting and environment and forestry and those kind of things. Um, I actually looked at uh, several uh, aspects of uh, contamination in water. And one of the things that I explored was uh, arsenic and fluoride poisoning. And a lot of people were at that time in the early 90s were actually talking about, uh, you know, they're trying to pinpoint uh, who, which agency was at fault. Was it the World Bank or, or, or you know, some other executing uh, body, you know, the Central Groundwater Board or somebody like that. Um, for me, the problem was something that possibly was deeper. The question that I had in mind was, why is arsenic or fluoride there in, in the first place? Why is it that we have this problem? Right? And actually, it's, it draws to something which is very, uh, something very uh, you know, pertinent to what Professor Forty had written, possibly, was it 1997 or 1998 in his book, uh, Earth and Intimate History, where he said that geology has a deep control beneath the oceans and continents. And I think it's very profound, because everything that happens to our lives today, the minerals that exist on our surface, the geological uh, features, the landscapes, the forests, the soils, the rivers, the inclination and the flow of the rivers, everything is dictated by processes of geology and things that shaped uh, uh, features and, uh, you know, uh, and landscapes. Uh, so I, I thought, uh, you know, this is something that I have, uh, you know, retained as a child and I've been troubled with questions uh, ever since I've been a child also, that why is it that uh, rivers that rise, say, in Mahabaleshwar or Panjgani flow right across the Indian subcontinent? Or why is it that you have a desert in, uh, in, uh, in northwest India? Or why is it that you have the Himalayas rising in the north and they go in an arc? And why is it that the uh, certain peaks are so high as the Kanchanchanga in the, in the east? Or, or Everest, which is dead in the center, you know? So these are questions that most of our teachers never, uh, you know, never attempted to answer. And these questions can kind of festered with me uh, right from my childhood. And this book is actually an attempt, uh, it's a 22 year long uh, attempt to find answers to all the questions that I, has, I had as a child. And what you have before you is some of the answers to what uh, I've been able to find out. So. I hope I have uh, answered the question you had. Can I just uh, put one thing in perspective? You know, one of the, I think some of you probably realize that we're going through a bit of a golden age with field guides in this country. Um, <clears throat> Richard, you perhaps don't know this, but there's a wealth of new field guides just tumbling out in India at the moment. We've had new book on the wildlife of Kana released yesterday, where somebody's done work, they've worked on the mammals, they've worked on the birds, the insects, the frogs, the damselflies, the, it's just an amazing book. And this is happening with more and more frequency, it's, it's gaining momentum. And I don't know if this happens in Britain at all, but with the exception of the, the father figure of field guides, of Dr. Sal Salim Ali, who started writing in the 1940s and 50s. 
it's now all amateurs. It's not, I mean, Pranay is a scientist, but he's not a paleontologist. And the remarkable thing here is that all the, all the writing that's happening is happening by amateurs who develop a serious interest in some aspect of natural history and go on to write field guides. And I think one of the reasons why their field guides work so well is that they've all recently been lay people themselves, and therefore they know how to write for other lay people. And that's one of, I think, you know, I, when, I, when I first read Indica, I was sure that, I mean, this is just the most amazing big book of this year. In a way, it makes me feel very small. We write about small things. We write about, you know, the trees of central India or the birds of a particular area. And suddenly, along comes this man who writes about 4.6 billion years of, you know, of, of evolution and natural history. It's an amazing book. And if any of you who will not have read this, I recommend very highly that you go out and do it. But the one question I have for you right away, Pranay, is can you talk to us about dinosaurs? It's everybody's, everybody's interested in dinosaurs, whether they're children or grown-ups. And you don't tend to, when you're growing up in India, you don't tend to know about Indian dinosaurs. You expect that all the dinosaurs you read about are American or perhaps Chinese, but tell us a little bit about Indian dinosaurs the way you've done it in the book. So, dinosaurs have uh, captured the imagination of every child and possibly every adult's mind. Um, so when dinosaurs were, invent, uh, were discovered maybe in the early 19th century, uh, the first dinosaur was called Megalosaurus, and it was described in 1824. But you know, the first Indian dinosaur was, that was discovered was in 1828, just four years after. But it took nearly 49 years for it to be given a name, a new label, which was then called Titanosaurus. So it took around 50 years, and you know, the British, uh, uh, you know, uh, army people and uh, surgeons and generals who were setting up cantonments and camps were finding bones of very, very large uh, dinosaurs and animals. And they were not sure what was happening. And so they kept sending this to the Indian Museum, which was one of the oldest museums in Calcutta. And from there, it got uh, you know, sent to the British Museum, Australian Indian Museum, and uh, eventually got studied about 50 years later. But you know, and also remark what's, what's also remarkable is that the word dinosaur came about 12 years after the first dinosaur was discovered in India. So that's, you know, that's how far we go in, this, in, in the fact that uh, we found our early dinosaurs. But you know, tragically, we have really not looked at uh, the dinosaurs that exist in India. And we've had uh, a, a variety of dinosaurs and a variety of discoveries uh, several expeditions by international organizations, yet they have not been documented and put together. And I found this very, very strange because uh, we had patchy information about uh, where you find these dinosaurs, but it was not put together and people, general public, never knew where th this was all about. Uh, my uh, sense is that if you were to go to uh, any school today and were to ask a child that, you know, can you name an, a dinosaur, they would be happy to rattle out, you know, a Tyrannosaurus rex or Stegosaurus or Diplodocus. You know, they would all talk about the American dinosaurs. And even if you were to go to rural India, you would be, if you were to say the word dinosaur, a child would know what dinosaurs are. And you know, I, I would say that you know, something like Hollywood and even the, the US museums have done a remarkable job to uh, market their dinosaurs. But what has been tragic is that Indian dinosaurs have never found the spotlight to actually get uh, you know, the acclaim that they should be getting. Let me show you a couple of slides, if you permit. <coughs> Is it on? Are we there? OK, right. We are on. So Pradeep, yeah, I think no, this is the first slide, yeah. yeah this is it. So Pradeep, you would recall, uh, this was, uh, you know, Pradeep and I did a tour with uh, one of India's foremost paleontologists uh, between uh, Jodhpur and Jaisalmer. We stopped for tea at a place, in, and uh, we asked somebody there that, you know, we heard that there was uh, 
uh, some geologists, some scientists who had come. This person was perplexed, but he remembered that a couple of months ago, there were some people who had come from Jaipur and said that uh, you know, there was a dinosaur footprint that was discovered. And he said excitedly, dinosaur, dinosaur. So then we got pointed to the site in the hill that you know, over there, we found some foot track, uh, trackways of dinosaurs. So in front of your screen, you see this uh, one rupee coin and a trident-shaped depression, which is a light dinosaur, which possibly went to this marine bed to look for possibly something that was lying on the beach. So there's a trackway there, and this is discovered by somebody who is in Jaipur, you know, University of Rajasthan, Professor D.K. Pandey, unfortunately, is not here. But you know, uh, you know, this is a very recent discovery. It's about uh, two and a half years ago when this discovery was made. And this is remarkable because India has a fantastic collection of uh, you know, dinosaur footprints, and very few of us actually know about it. Let me show you something else. Uh, one of the first uh, uh, large discoveries of nesting sites in the world took place in India. And you know, this is a depression of uh, eggs that have been taken away, but you see the depressions, those round depressions in, in, in the ground. And in 1988, uh, Professor Ashok Sani, one of India's foremost paleontologists, was you know, shown a cannonball. Uh, it looked like a large uh, you know, coconut-sized cannonball. And, uh, you know, and this was being found in uh, cement factories around Baroda. And they were being used to line uh, garden paths and you know, around put on shelves of uh, the factory manager. And it was quite a conundrum for anybody who found these because they were not sure what these were. They were perfectly round and nobody knew what they were. So when it, it, uh, this, the first uh, cannonball-shaped rock was shown to Professor Sani, he took it to his lab in Punjab University, and within a week, he was able to say that this was an egg of a dinosaur. And what he did was, he actually looked at the surface of the, the round uh, cannonball and was able to say that the pore size matched quite like that of birds. And this, the eggs that they had found was from Titanosaurus, one of the largest uh, grass-eating dinosaurs that were found in India. It's the same dinosaur which was discovered first uh, by uh, William Sleeman in 1924, which I talked about. Let me just show you a couple of more slides. This is another slide of titanosaurs. You find flat rocks with embedded um, uh, uh, eggs in them, like this. This is uh, from a place called Indroda, which is near uh, Ahmedabad. We found a temple near Dhar. It's a, a tribal temple, and if you Notice closely, I'm not sure whether you're able to see them, there's these light orange lines, and this is deep inside a, you know, it's a dark temple. And you can see that this is actually a collection, it's a clutch of uh, eggs. And what these tribals have done is they thought that this was a collection of shivlings. They thought this was the most pious of all links that they had found. So it got the center of the, uh, of the temple. So you, know, so you can find these, uh, you know, dinosaur eggs and very curious things in temples as well. Uh, one of the, another remarkable discovery that has taken place uh, from the same site where the cannonballs were found was this uh, collection of what looked like a collection of bones and eggs. And uh, let me show you the next slide what this is all about. And this was uh, discovered in uh, the early 80s. And this is what they found when they took an x-ray of it. There was a snake and there were two eggs. And there was a small, um, I don't have a pointer, but if you see below on the right to your screen, there's this outline of a gray creature. And this is a young hatchling of a titanosaur, or some sauropod for that guy. And when it was reconstructed, it is this. And you know, this is a snake which is going to attack a fresh hatchling of a giant snake called Sanaje. Now what is uh, really, really, Interesting is because uh, th we didn't have an understanding where these kind of snakes, the ones that could devour a uh, live prey or an egg on its entirety, that now we know that they have possibly evolved in eastern Gondwana, the part where India was nestled along with uh, Madagascar and Australia and uh, Antarctica. So we have similar snakes in Australia which can detach their uh, lower jaws and also eat this, but they got extinct recently. Uh, this is a remarkable creature. 
again found not too far from the site where the snake was found. And this is called Rajasaurus. Now, it was again, it took 20 odd years before the bones were found and the discovery was reported in a journal. Uh, for a very long time, this uh, uh, remarkable predator, they called it Rajasaurus because Raja is king and Saurus means a lizard. And uh, it took a very long time for geologists, uh, paleontologists in India to collaborate with international uh, paleontologists to you know, put together this dinosaur. And this dinosaur, although slightly smaller than a T-Rex, would possibly be more powerful than a T-Rex because it had a much stronger bite. And it was lighter. And uh, what paleontologists have been able to find is that it is possibly what, if you were to compare Mike Tyson with, say, Evander Holyfield, you know, slightly built, but extremely powerful. So there's a reconstruction painting that was done for the book, especially for this book. So I'm very proud that you know there's a Russian artist who's done this for me. Uh, you know, you see the Rajasaurus on your left-hand side of your screen with two smaller uh, dinosaurs, uh, which are competing with it. It's called uh, uh, Indosaurus. And there's something which are smaller, the green-colored creatures that are eating on the tidbits that have been stolen from the dead Titanosaurus, which is called uh, Indosuchus. One of the most beautiful things to come out of India is possibly not a very beautiful thing. It's called coprolite. Now, coprolite is basically fossilized dinosaur dung. Uh, but dinosaur dung hold some remarkable and amazing uh, stories about what dinosaurs ate and uh, how they ate and what they ate. And if you were to make a cross-section of these fossilized dung, it looks like a bit like your brain, you know? It's got these folds and it's got remains of leaves and uh, whatever they ate. And if you were to look at it uh, under a lens, it actually looks like folds of your brain, you know? And uh, what scientists have been able to find out is uh, that uh, one of the discoveries that they've made looking at coprolite is that grasses, which until uh, about 10 years ago were thought to have been originated in the Americas, were actually something that possibly originated in Gondwana and possibly India. And they found the family of, uh, you know, from the studies that they made on the coprolite, that studies of families of rice and bamboo in this coprolite, the cross-section that you have on your right. Uh, this is my final story on dinosaur. I won't bore you with more. But this is a dinosaur called Bruhakitisaurus, which is uh, basically loosely translated in Sanskrit as huge bodied dinosaurs, a lizard. Now, it was discovered in 1988-89. Uh, uh, and uh, what happened is, whoops. So uh, when the scientists, uh, two scientists found these, uh, the bones of this dinosaur, they were in this shape. You know, the photographs that you have on the left and the drawings that they made are on the right. When they made the discovery, they were very large bones. And they did not have the wherewithal to actually carry these bones with them back to their field office, which was in Hyderabad. And the rains were impending, and they decided that, you know, let's leave them here. The bones are so large that we can leave them behind. And we'll come back the next year and take them. Unfortunately for them, the rains were very heavy. And they, when they came back to the site, they did not find these bones. But they had photographs, and they had made some field drawings. And they decided to publish this paper. With not having the bones of very good photographs, they, they came up with this image. And when they pieced together the, the evidence that they had on the size of the, uh, the bones, they said that this could well be the largest dinosaur in the world. You know, this is about 48 to 52 meters long. You know, it's possibly the largest dinosaur that was discovered at that time. And a lot of people in, in the Americas, sorry, decided to challenge this because they wanted to see the bones for themselves, and they couldn't find any. And the photographs were no good. And as a result, this dinosaur lost its place from being the biggest in the world to not existing at all. So that's the fate of all the dinosaurs and all the prehistoric things that we have uh, in our country, because there are no museums, there are no repositories, there are no catalogs. 
And tragically, much of the stuff that we find in field, they, there's no way for us to put them together in a museum. And uh, material like this is always, uh, you know, misplaced. So. Well, I, just, just to follow on from that, uh, I'm sure you'd like to explain why the most important thing that happened was at the end of the dinosaur's career, uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs, often regarded as rather mysterious. We know much more about it now. And many scientists believe that India is implicated in their demise. Um, maybe you'd like to explain. <laughs> uh, right, I think it's a question that I was uh, quite prepared for because, uh, you know, this is a favorite question. It's a cheese question in all, uh, uh, all conversations, that if they were so, uh, so dominant and so, so powerful, why should a dynasty like the dinosaurs die? So in the 1970s and till the mid late 80s, there was really no answer to why dinosaurs died. And in fact, there were cartoons floating around. And I think, Richard, you remember one, uh, an American dinosaur in which they show this large uh, 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 brontosaurus-looking creature being, uh, you know, and, with, and, and its tail being eaten by a rat-like creature. And you know, yeah, 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 those kind of uh, uh, cartoons. And there was no understanding of how they had died. But you know, what was very clear for scientists was that after 67 and 66 million years, there, there was a complete gap in fossils. There was no fossil of any large dinosaur. And so we know for, for a certainty that there, were, there was a massive event of some kind which killed all dinosaurs. And uh, if you permit me, I'll just uh, show you a couple of slides which uh, will actually give you an understanding of what uh, I'm trying to say. So let's start with first, uh, you know, what was happening uh, globally uh, 200 million years ago. So India, if you see that yellow star in the, in the picture, uh, is where India is nestled. It's right in the center. It's surrounded with Africa and Madagascar to its west, Antarctica and Australia to its east. And I'll go quickly now. What happens at 120 million years ago, there is something that happens in the south of uh, uh, of uh, South America and South Africa. And there's a big volcanic event here which breaks away South America from Africa and Antarctica. Uh, around 130 million years ago, uh, there's another event that happens, which is on somewhere where we have in uh, a place called Raj Mahal district. I don't know if many of you know this, but it's in, uh, it's in Eastern Bihar. And uh, there was a massive volcanic event there. And what that did is it, it, it separated, it paired off uh, Australia, Antarctica, and India. So India, about 100 million years ago, was only left with one companion, and that was Madagascar. And about 88 million years ago, there was another volcanic event which separated India with Madagascar. And, oops, and then came the Deccan event. Um, what has happened is that uh, there are two theories that, that are there for explaining the dinosaurs. Like I said, uh, Western scientists were convinced that after 67, 66 million years ago, there were no bones. In 1987, there was this study by uh, a father and son duo called the, uh, called the Alvarezes, uh, who said they found a very large uh, iridium radiation uh, zone in a marble site in Gubbio in Italy. And they were, they were convinced that there was a meteorite or an asteroid strike somewhere in the world around that time which could have caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. So what they were now looking for was a massive event that could have occurred around this time. Now, if you were to look at this image, uh, on the left-hand side where America is, if you know where Florida is, just have a look there. There's a slightly circular patch, and that patch is the one where the asteroid had fallen. This is called the Chicxulub meteor, right? It's on the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, and, and it's kind of a circular site, yeah? Now, what they say is that it's about 2,000 times the size of, the, of both the atomic bombs that fell 
in, in Japan during, during World War II. That's the enormity of the, the size of the explosion that must have occurred when this asteroid fell. But this discovery was in early 1990s, and it was uh, considered by many geologists and many paleontologists of the time, and I'm, I'm sure Richard would be able to uh, uh, you know, give you more uh, examples of it, that it was considered sealed, that you know, we found the answer, and this is the silver bullet, and that's it, the end. But what we now know is increasingly, and there are some studies done by ONGC in India and some other uh, deep uh, 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 rigging uh, studies of uh, soil horizons, that this may not be true. Now, the two red dots that you see in this image uh, are the ones that are very important for us. What happened is, when India broke off from Madagascar, it started moving at great speeds northwards. And as it started moving at a high speed, somewhere it hit a place called the Reunion Island, what is now called the Reunion Island. It kind of stepped on a landmine. And there, it kind of went berserk. There was, there was a plume from below which, it, which was coming. Now, a plume is basically a, a large uh, flow of lava that comes from below, and it, uh, it comes out like a match head, and it kind of melts the, the mantle, the, the, the top surface of the earth, the crust. And once a landmass uh, touches that plume, it causes massive flows of lava. Let me just show you what I mean. So the two red dots, let me just finish this. So uh, the, the two red dots that you see, one on the left is a, a big uh, dot, and the one on the right is slightly small. The one on the left is the one which was slightly larger, and it started in, uh, somewhere in Sindh and Gujarat of today. And the one on the right is the, a minor volcanic episode that happened about 68.7 million years ago. And that happened around Lalitpur. And it was just a lava flow. It was not volcanic uh, as we imagine, uh, like uh, Hawaii or not those kinds. I'll just show you a picture of what I mean. Uh, I'll come back to this later. But So this is what, I, what a, a, a lava flow looked like. It's called a flood uh, basalt flow, you know, flood lavas. And what happens is that there are fissures that are created on the ground, and huge amounts of lava come out and pour out in the way that you see those gray lines and the black lines, they are deposits, okay? And it builds layer upon layer, layer upon layer, till it sandwiches uh, the previous layer. So it looks something like this. If anybody's traveled by train in the Western Ghats, especially around Mahabaleshwar, Panjgiri, uh, you know, Mathiran, Khandala, you would see, uh, mountains like these, right? You see these gray layers of, mount, of, uh, of lava uh, that they look like layered cake, okay? So, so this was the first episode that happened. And, and, but the biggest episode to take place was around 67 million years ago. And this is what is very contentious and what uh, Richard was pointing to. Uh, in the last seven or eight years, we've increasingly found evidence from s studies of small micro uh, uh, organisms called foraminiferas. I mean, they're not microscopic, but they are easy to spot with your, uh, with your hand lens. And foraminifers have been showing that there has been a rapid decline around 67.6 uh, million years ago. And for 200,000 years, there was a rapid decline in the diversity of these very sensitive organisms called foraminiferas. Now, there's another paper that is published very recently uh, by uh, uh, Michael Benton and Stephen Brusate, and they collected data from all over the world of dinosaur populations from 70 million years ago till their demise. And they found that the extinction of the dinosaur coincides exactly with the second episode of the Deccan. And the decline of the dinosaurs actually began 250,000 to 200,000 years before the meteorite strike that I was talking about earlier, the Chicxulub uh, meteorite. So, so the implication here is that the Deccan lava flow possibly had a bigger hand 
in causing the decline of the dinosaur, and possibly the meteor was the death blow. It possibly led to the decline or the demise, the full demise, the complete extinction of the dinosaurs. You know, the, the Deccan chapter is one of the great chapters in the book. I've enjoyed that immensely. But Pranay, one of the things that I don't understand is you have this massive extinction. How does life squeeze through that gap? And how do the mammals, you know, how do you explain the, you know, the mammals and how they recover from this? Right. That's a great question. Uh, it's be, it, it was an, uh, a mystery again for paleontologists because you know, till you don't find uh, a good uh, collection of bones, especially uh, mammal bones, uh, from layers before and after Deccan uh, eruptions, you would not be able to piece the information of how evolution occurred. So let me again take a few slides and try showing you something that I might have. Uh, Okay, um, uh, this is a very beautiful site and thankfully not trampled by too many humans, so I kind of like it. This is the Bagh Caves. It's, in, it's about uh, 110 kilometers west of uh, Indore. And you know, you can see the, uh, the caves uh, right in the center where the tree line is. And just below it, there's a big fat gray layer, which is the Deccan, the second da Deccan lava flow. The caves have been carved out from a limestone. Now this is called the Lametta beds. Now the Lametta beds are an excellent source of bones, especially mammalian bones. And if you go higher up, there's another thin layer of uh, Deccan lava flow, which is I think the third lava flow, and then it ceases. But you have again a series of uh, uh, limestone beds which reveal fantastic collections of mammalian bones. And the mammals that survived from the great extinctions were possibly the size of a mouse or a, any insectivore, which is slightly the size of a, of a mouse or, a, or sorry, a rat or slightly larger. Uh, what was amazing of, about the extinction was that nothing larger than 25 kilos survived. And, and this is an enlargement of the uh, limestone bed from uh, from Bach, and if you again see at the bottom, there's this thick gray layer, which is the second lava flow, the second episode, and on top there's a thin gray layer, which is the final uh, episode of lava flow, and these beds actually reveal very good uh, uh, fossils of mammals and also uh, sharks. And let me give you a, one of the things that uh, you find, and wherever you find limestone that is embedded between Deccan lava flows, which hold these records, you are able to find amazing and really, really wonderful evidence of fossils. And this is, can you, can you spot what, what, what is here? There is an outline of a frog. And this is from Worli Sea Phase. Anybody from Mumbai? Wow, okay. So this is from Worli, you know, the Worli Sea Phase. If you know Jewel of India, you know, uh, NSUI, uh, the, the, the Vallabhai Stadium, it's just behind that that this was discovered. And you can find an amazing collection of crocodile eggs, of turtles, and, uh, and several marine animals here. And if you go further down south towards Cafe Nas in Malabar Hill, uh, you would again find amazing collection of tortoise eggs uh, and, and crocodile eggs. So, you know, any way where you find limestone between uh, a layer of sediments uh, that got deposited between two lava flows, you are bound to find some animals that recolonized and got preserved like this. And you know, this was very amazing when discoveries were made all across India in, in uh, sediment beds like this. But let me now come to what happened after the dinosaurs. Can, can I just ask you, sure. what, what are the intervals between the flows? What, what time periods are we talking about? Sorry. Okay. So the, uh, so the second lava flow was one continuous flow, okay? So it lasted about 100, 100 to 150,000 years. But then it ceased for some time, and then there were spurts that happened. And then there was, uh, there was rest for about 10,000 years or 20,000 years, and again there was revival of life, and then there was death again because there was a final episode that was happening. So there was intermittent periods where 
uh, lava came in copious amounts and just inundated land. And let me just show that to you where how the inundation actually took place, I'm sorry. So there was this image that I had shown earlier, which I didn't describe, I apologize. But you know, if you were to look at the red space, this is what was happening 67 million years ago when the second episode took place. It was massive, and it kept pouring and pouring and pouring, and it, although the uh, emissions were happening, sorry, the, the extrusion of lava was taking place on the west of India, between uh, where Reunion Island and India had rubbed each other, uh, the lava flow was going as far as the eastern coast of India. It actually, there's a lava flow which actually uh, exists even in Rajmundri and goes into the Bay of Bengal. So that's the nature of lava flow. There was a river of lava that kept flowing and flowing and flowing. And think about it, it's happening for 100,000, maybe 150,000 years. You know? And it's lava that does not cease to stop flowing and just builds upon layer upon layer. So, so let me come back to uh, Pradeep's uh, question of what happened. So the first creatures to take advantage of after the death of the dinosaurs were curiously the birds. The birds had grown in size and had challenged the space which was vacated by the dinosaurs. And the other opportunistic uh, advantage was taken by crocodiles. They were land crocodiles. They did not depend entirely on water for survival. So, the birds and the land crocodiles were actually having a strong turf battle for dominance. In, in the background was a creature like this, which had survived, and it was still scurrying in the ground. You know, it was an insectivore. It would feed opportunistically on whatever it found. You know? And they would be, because they were mammals, they lived in close units and lived uh, in, in groups and in, in, in the undergrowth. And they would actually feed either late at night or very early in the morning. That's because the birds would, like very large birds, would only wake up very early in the morning. Although they were warm-blooded, they would not hunt at night. Crocodiles also did not hunt at night, at least not on land. So these creatures started to uh, actually uh, you know, make a living at a time when the two dominant predators the birds and the crocodiles were not uh, feeding. So that was very crucial for their survival. So. I was just going to point out, because it hasn't been mentioned, that of course the dinosaurs didn't go extinct. Uh, because it's now understood that birds are living dinosaurs. So something, one of the dinosaurs, or a group of the dinosaurs, did go through this catastrophic event. But of course, they were relatively small. They weren't the lumbering giants that are the dinosaurs of the popular imagination. They, and they were already ready feathered. So they were, they were kind of in position to take this leading predator role immediately after the big chaps went. That's right. Can I ask you to tell the story? I think we're running out of time, but just briefly, one of the big stories in this book is the evolution of the whales on the west coast of India. So can you just <clears throat> briefly tell the audience about whales? Right, so I'm going to, again, um, take you back to the maps because this is very crucial. What had happened, sorry, I'm just uh, going to go back and uh, you know, start from where we were at, you know, after India ended its volcanic uh, uh, you know, episodes were, were waning, India began to move at a very rapid rate because volcanism was happening under the Indian Ocean, even when India left uh, the Reunion Island and it separated from the plume. Uh, and this was propelling India towards Eurasia at great speeds. And if you re recall, India was where today South Africa is about 150 million years ago. Remember the map that 200 million years ago I'd shown you? India has traveled, is possibly the most traveled country. So if you, you are surprised at our Indian diaspora, you should be because it's there in our land, you know. So where, you know, so the place you remember, the Bouvé Island, which is south of Cape Town, is where India was and it started separating from there and look where it had reached in just 100 million years. You know, this is a huge distance in terms of geology. 
you know, possibly the most traveled land in the world. Now, let's see what happens. You know, again, we look at other, other, other uh, land masses. Australia is virtually where it is. The Americas are nearly settled, okay? Look at where India is. India is still far away from colliding. Uh, with, uh, you know, fully colliding with Eurasia. But look at the movement that it's going to have. And look at this, you know. And this is where we are, you know. This is how we collide. And this is when the Himalayas actually start to form. They are low foothills at this time. It's only the Tibet which is rising, you know. And what is interesting now is, you know, look at this sea that is there from Beijing till Gibraltar, there's a big sea, and this is called the Tethys. It's the mightiest sea, which goes right across the tropics, okay? And this is where much of the action happens for mammals. Okay. And as India closes in, this is what happens, right? So the whole story of the, of the mammals and the whales starts here. So let me come straight to the whales. So this is our friend who actually, you can, it's, uh, in India, it's the, one of the earliest ones is called Deconolestes because it was found in the Deccan. In, uh, in Wales, this is called Morganocudon. And uh, in other parts of the world, there are several other insectivores that were found. But you know, something like this is the ancestor of all the mammals that exist today. You know, this, that's what is uh, possibly the agreed, uh, that's the consensus amongst all paleontologists today. But, what happens is that there's one creature, uh, you know, there's a lot of competition as mammals began to grow in size. And there's some creatures that say that, listen, we need, there's, there's a need to find new sources of food. And there's one creature like this one, it's called Indohyus, which is the Indian pig. And this starts ducking into water to start eating uh, reeds and, you know, you know, water chestnuts and lettuces and water, water lettuces and things like that, you know, any, any succulents that it could find in the water. What happens is eventually a, a, a descendant of the indo uh, starts living closer to the water. Instead of just living in the edge of the forest, it starts living in the water. And this is where it actually decides, or not decides, I mean, it's something that happens in terms of evolutionary terms, that it depends on water increasingly for its food. And this creature is called Pachycetus. A creature like the Pachycetus, about two million years later, starts taking deeper dives into, the, uh, the, into, into, uh, into shallow lakes and starts chasing fish. And this creature is called Ambulocetus. That means a, seed, a walking whale. Ambulo as in ambulance. So ambulance as in uh, cetus is for whale. So Ambulocetus means a walking whale. Now this is still terrestrial. This creature still walks on land, on soft land, it does not venture too far from a pond or a lake, but it would certainly depend on something that is lurking around the lakes or within the lakes. And then there are creatures like this, this is called Kachisetus. Now remember I said Pachycetus earlier, and this is Kachisetus. Now there was a big rivalry of discoveries that was taking place across the border. So if the, if the Pakistani uh, scientists found something, it was called, given a name from Pakistan. And if there was something found in India, so it was called Kachi Cetus because it was a natural descendant of, uh, so, you know, this is where the other battles were also being fought other than uh, terrestrial and aquatic. And eventually, there was one final, uh, uh, you know, uh, evolutionary leap by the descendants of the Paki Cetus, and they decided to become, or not decided, I'm sorry, I'm using this word, but, you know, there was something that fated them to become entirely aquatic. And this is the Basilosaurus. It's wrongly called Basilosaurus because bas basil, me, basil actually means king and saurus is a lizard. But this is not a lizard. But when it was discovered, it was called a lizard. But Basilosaurus is the real ancestor of all the whales that exist today, all the whales and dolphins and porpoises. And so this is where, I, and from, from where all the whales actually emerged. We have a little time to... <laughs> We have a little time to open the house for questions, but do you want to say something before we... I would, all I wanted to, as, a, as the first question, uh, using President's rights, um, the, uh, are the bones of these wonderful creatures safely curated? You said that the other, other dinosaurs weren't safely curated. Are these being looked after? Um, sadly, no. In fact, uh, 
if you really want to see the bones of all the discoveries that have been made in India and Pakistan, you'll have to travel to, uh, possibly to uh, Ohio, because the person who is actually an expert on the world's paleo whales uh, is somebody who lives uh, in Ohio and actually teaches in Ohio. Uh, the discoveries have been made in India. They are scattered bones with uh, people who discovered them in India, like Professor Ashok Sani and you know, Sunil Bajpai and some very fine scientists. But again, the problem is these are large bones. And when scientists retire in India, especially geologists, uh, they have a large collection of bones. And where do you think they can keep them? They want to leave it back with the departments, but they're not well cataloged. There's no space in departments. They can't take it back to, you know, the cities or wherever they tend to retire. You know, there's a, they're, they're, they take a lot of space. Eventually, uh, it, there's, a, there's a bit of a joke that if you want to find fossils in India, don't go out in the field. Just go out the geology department, and you will find bones and remains of you know, creatures, because they've been left by all these paleontologists. And you know, that's the tragedy of our lives. So I'm sorry, I, I've, I've gone all over the place, but yeah. It's real bad news. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I think we have time for just a few questions. So if um, <clears throat> you can raise your hands, and we'll get a mic to reach you. This gentleman here, can you get a mic? This person, please. Please keep your questions short and ensure that questions are not. Is this on? Okay. Hi. Um, should I stand up? It was a bit weird. I'll just sit down. Um, thank you. Very interesting talk. Um, just going to say, my favourite cartoon that uh, depicts the extinction of the dinosaurs is Gary Larson's The Far Side, where I think a tr Triceratops and a T Rex are smoking behind a boulder but I don't think that one's entirely accurate. Um, I did my master's at the Natural History Museum uh, in uh, taxonomy and biodiversity, so hello. Um, so kind of two questions, because I, I also work in education in Mumbai. Um, first question is to Professor Forte. Um, how do we feel about Dippy leaving the entrance to the Natural History Museum and being replaced by a diving blue whale, which I think is quite exciting personally. And then on a second side, in terms of education, I, I work in several schools in, in Mumbai, and um, a lot of my stuff is about arts, but also yeah, with my background in science. How do you, sorry? Oh, sorry. My question is, how do you use this knowledge in your book to you, uh, get conservation happening at, in the educational system, uh, in mainstream education, as well as you know, private schools? Well, you answer that. So the first question is for Lord Richard. Lord yeah, the dinosaur. Dippy. Um, I, this is a highly political question. Uh, the moving a famous fossil that has been there. But it's um, uh, actually, the short answer is, it's returning the Natural History Museum in London to how it was when it first opened, which is when the blue whale was there and not Dippy the dinosaur. Uh, now back to India. So um, thank you. Good question. Um, you know, my book is, uh, is actually a testament of frustrations, you know. It's basically, these are questions that I had as a child. And I think I really congratulate you that the kind of work that you're trying to do is, you know, bring in education and, you know, conservation together. Um, I, I fervently hope that, you know, we are able to integrate the sciences. I think the, the real problem with conservation of any kind, even an international diaspora, is the fact that we break down our science and say the chemists will not talk to the physicists and the physicists do not talk to the biologists and the geologists are nowhere anyways because they have the answers. Frankly, believe me, they do. And they are not part of any discussions or any uh, you know, debates or policy making that actually takes place even internationally. Uh, if you were to look at say IPCC, just check out how many geologists, uh, people, people with geology background or geologists are there. They're not. So that's, that's one. My other, uh, uh, my, my main point with you on conservation and education and environment uh, related things is that, you know, we need to start looking at our syllabi a little more holistically. And we also need to encourage children to ask questions. Currently, the focus is this is the, the prescribed syllabi and you need to just study this. You don't need to connect the dots between different disciplines. And I think that's possibly clear, you know, killing all the creativity that exists in a child's mind. So, another question? Gentlemen, 
Um, thanks, Pramay, for a great talk. Um, so if you actually uh, look at a few books on science which have become wildly popular, honestly, there haven't been too many, right? I mean, uh, one sort of uh, thinks about, say, David Attenborough, for instance, Life on Earth, uh, you know, Indica obviously reminds us a lot of that. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, as an oddball, Bill Bryson, you know, uh, which, which becomes wildly popular. So what's the secret sauce, uh, and, and uh, in your opinion, and, and sort of how did you uh, take that into account while even writing? For, for, popularity of, of the book itself when it comes out. I don't know whether it's popular yet, but yeah, I hope after, after your question and after JLF it becomes popular. But you know, again, I, like I said, it is a testament of frustrations. I'm trying to answer questions which, you know, our geography teachers, our biology teachers and everybody else did not answer. So I have been in a quest to answer those questions and really, I mean, although I have read much of David Attenborough and some of Bryson and many others, and of course, Professor Forty has been a big inspiration. Uh, I have really not tried looking at uh, any format or any styles or in, in writing. I've tried to do a chronology. You know, I start from the oldest time and come to the arrival of man. And I think that's what I think we need to piece together to bring in appreciation about our subcontinent. I think that's about it. There's a young person yeah, at yeah. the the second row, third row. Hello, my name is Vandit. I want to ask that how did dodo birds got extinct? Sorry, who? How? Dodo birds. Dodo. Dodo. Dodo birds, oh, you know. The, yeah, the British Museum knows better. The Natural History Museum knows best. Why? Dodo. What, how, how, how did they die? Yeah. Oh, well, that. Uh, um, of course, the main agent of extinction right at the present day is humankind. And the dodo was one of the first examples where we, it is known that we humans exterminated a species. They were big, flightless birds in Mauritius, and when people landed there, it was like their dinners walking around on two legs. And at that time, there was no real idea of conservation. And the, the notion, the childhood notion of killing the goose that laid the golden egg does not seem as generally to have rooted in our own species. Uh, but the dodo, of course, is merely the first, and we've witnessed the greatest mass extinction since that of the dinosaurs going on right now. And, of course, it's a completely different topic, but uh, we don't know where we're going either because there's never been an extinction event like this in the history of the planet. We have time for just one last question. So I don't know how to choose with all the hands that have gone up, but the lady here. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you, you have this perspective of millions of and today we're talking about climate change. So um, as somebody who's studied climate change technically over that many millions of years, do you feel like when we talk about mitigating climate change today, it, it's something we can do, or is it an inevitability of what you've seen over time? Okay. Um, thank you for the question. It's a very pertinent question. Um, what used to happen earlier was that Earth was dominated by several species, and the land mass by itself, and the, and the waterways, uh, and, and the, all the water bodies, were not hugely manipulated by human agency. Uh, Currently, all of the reservoirs and the sinks and things that can mitigate climate change have been completely decimated by humans. And I think that is an amazing thing. And one thing that I talk about in my book, which came as a surprise to me when I read it, was that 22% of all carbon that is uh, mitigated globally happens because of the sediments in the Ganga and the Brahmaputra. And this is something that you know very, very few people, even in the climate change world, do not know. Right? Now, I'm, what I'm trying to drive at is that geology and geophysical sciences have several answers. And several solutions that have been provided for in the current context of climate change are pretty flawed. And I think there needs to be a serious relook with the invitation to people from other disciplines rather than just those people who are saying that conserve uh, forests and plant more trees. 
Uh, yes, it works, but there are many, many other ways in which conservation works, including saving, uh, you know, the Ganga Brahmaputra, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole system and the mountains. And uh, I, I would encourage you to read that chapter and the end notes because it explains to you the whole chemistry of what happens. So. Well, I'm afraid you, we still have left two billion years unaccounted for. So if you want to find out about those two billion years, you must buy Pranay's book. Uh, so I would like to thank Pranay and Tradi for contributing to this discussion of a wonderful new book. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our speakers for that really illuminating session, Pranay Lal, Pradeep Krishan, and Richard Forte. They will be signing books. The book signing tent is out of Baitak, and on the right, it's green in color. Thank you. <laughs>